Welcome to the MOOC's course in Organic Chemical Technology. The title of today's lecture is Metallurgical Industries Part 2. Before going into the details of today's lecture, we will have a recapitulation of what we have discussed in the previous lecture. We have uh, started our introduction uh, with a connection between chemical engineering and then uh, metallurgical engineering or chemical industries versus metallurgical industries. So then uh, why we started uh, looking at the connection because this course is inorganic chemical technology, then why do we need to study about metallurgical industries. So then what we realize that whatever the not all but many of the products that chemical industries produce like lime, uh, coke, oxygen etc. are being utilized by this metallurgical industries for different types of processes which occur in metallurgical industries. Right, something like iron making, steel making. So there we are using this coke, etc., oxygen, etc. There we are using. Right. Uh, similarly, like metallurgical industry is not only a consumer of chemical products, but also byproducts of uh, this uh, metallurgical industry is something like you know sulfur dioxide, H2SO4 from the uh, ZNS smelting process or copper smelting process, etc. Or you know kind of good products of uh, chemical plants. Right. So, these byproducts of these plants are uh, byproducts of metallurgical industries are uh, proper uh, chemical plant products like H2SO4, etc. So, there is a connection, right. Similarly, like you know, several types of non ferrous uh, metals are used for uh, different types of applications, uh, household, domestic, uh, industrial purpose, etc. Also, whatever the principles of uh, chemical engineering uh, are there, they are being increasingly utilized for the metallurgical industries uh, for a continuous process. So that to improve the high output of the metallurgical industries. So because of such kind of connections, it is essential to know for uh, undergraduate UG level students a few basics about metallurgical industries. So then we started discussing about metallurgical industries. Out of which we have taken uh, different types of metallurgical products like iron and steel and then non-ferrous uh, metals like you know aluminum, zinc, copper and then uh, lead etc. These kind of products uh, their manufacturing we are going to study. So in the previous lecture we have already discussed about manufacturing of iron. So iron we got it from the iron ores where iron ores along with the coke, lime etc. have been taken into uh, blast furnace where the reduction of these ores takes place and then you get a iron, pig iron, right. This would be further uh, oxidized to get a pure uh, iron because whatever the iron that you get from the blast furnace, it may be having impurities like you know sulfur, phosphorus, carbon, etc. So these impurities you, you have to uh, remove. How do we uh, remove them? By oxidizing. By oxidizing this molten pig iron, you can remove uh, oxides of the sulfur, phosphorus, etc. and then you can get the pure iron. So, but pure iron uh, we found that it is of no use because it is soft uh, in nature as well as its uh, melting point is very high. So then what you do? You have to do proper alloying with the carbon to get the steel. So these alloying etc. Uh, can be done in you know electric furnaces, those things we have seen. Then we have also uh, discussed about the sponge iron which is nothing but directly uh, reduced iron are obtained by direct reduction of iron. Whatever the hematite or magnetite ore is there that if you react with uh, CO or H2 or carbon then what will happen? You will get a iron right which is sponge iron which is having purity of approximately 90 to 94 percent similar like you know pig iron. Right. So, iron content of this sponge iron is about 90 to 94 percent which is on par with the pig iron. But it is having uh, several disadvantages as well. Though the advantage of this uh, production of sponge iron by DRA method or direct reduction method is that you know avoiding the complications of uh, blast furnaces. Blast furnaces are having several complications especially from the design and then operating conditions point of view. So those you can avoid if you do this sponge iron production. Uh, by direct uh, reduction of iron ores. How you do it? Because this you do, uh, you know, uh, you take the iron ores and then uh, you do the reduction either using CO, H2 or uh, C but at lower temperature like something less than 1200 degrees centigrade something like that so that melting of uh, ore is not required. 
So if the melting of ore is not required, so then obviously you can avoid the using blast furnaces, etc. So that is the advantage it is having, right? Further, the whatever the heat evaluated uh, because of this uh, direct reduction of iron ore to get small iron, so that heat may be utilized in further alloying purpose as well. So that those two are advantage of this sponge iron or you know DRI production by direct reduction. But disadvantage it is very it get oxidized sponge iron easily get oxidized or it will be uh, rusted or corroded if you don't protect properly. So these are the kind of disadvantages are also there. So sponge iron from the production point of view it is having advantage of not. Uh, using blast furnace or uh, getting away with the complications of blast furnace, but it is having the disadvantages of uh, getting easily oxidized or rusted if not protected. That is the reason if not protected. That is the reason this sponge iron whatever is produced that is directly or quickly utilized to produce the steel by doing proper alloying with the carbon. So, this is what we have seen in the previous lecture. In this lecture we are going to discuss about non-ferrous metals production how it is being done in metallurgical industries. So, let us start today's discussion on non-ferrous metals production. We start with aluminum. It is non-ferrous metal with unique applications. What are the applications? If you see alumina has emerged as a substitute and complementary material in the uh, several of market segments. Some of them are presented here. So, like in electric power transmissions, electrical power generations, transport by air, rail, road and water, then architecture, engineering, construction, communication market. This aluminum is used not only for that, for canning, packaging, alloys, explosives, defense, utensils uh, as substitute for wood and then tin plates etc. also this aluminum is used. It is having so many applications, so many applications both domestic, industrial and then including the defense purpose as well. Uh, like in explosives also it is used, right? So, because of that one you can see that market for aluminum is very huge though it is not a direct market, but indirect market uh, it is having applications or uh, utilization in several of these market segments. So, its production is uh, going to be uh, very beneficial for the growth of uh, any country, okay? So, aluminum has made inroads into all of these applications with varying level of market penetrations because so it is not like that 90 percent is used in one uh, electrical power generations only and then remaining 10 percent is used for other purpose. It is not like that varying proportions are there and then depending on the uh, need you know the proportions changes, okay? How much aluminum is required for a given market or for a given production purpose of any of these uh, you know material that are mentioned. So, know that changes from application to the applications, right? So now this aluminum production is not possible to directly uh, produce from the uh, bauxite ore. Actually bauxite ore is used to produce alumina or aluminum oxide which is Al2O3. That Al2O3 would be further you know reduced in uh, electrolytic cells to get the aluminum metal, okay? So first what we have to do? We have to understand the process to get alumina or aluminum oxide from the bauxite ore and then using that alumina for the production of aluminum metal. So let us start with production of Al2O3 which is a raw material for production of aluminum. So directly aluminum production is not possible. In fact, this aluminum production is done by the electrolytic cell approach, right? So that is a different process whereas Al2O3 production is more or less like any of the inorganic chemical production that we have seen that is uh, size reduction of the ore, purification of the ore, reaction of the ore and then separation of the product something like those kind of steps. So all those things we are going to see now. So uh, how to get this uh, Al2O3? So what is the raw material for this Al2O3 production? It is nothing but the bauxite. Major source of aluminum oxide or alumina which is used in electrolytic reduction cells is bauxite. So, this bauxite is used to get aluminum oxide or alumina which would be used in electrolytic uh, reduction cells to get aluminum metal, okay? So, this bauxite usually contains 50 to 60 percent of uh, Al2O3 ore with the balance of silica and iron. Purification process for electrolytic cell grade alumina is described here first. First you have to get the alumina and then alumina of uh, which grade? It should have a higher grade so that it can be treated in electrolytic cells to get the aluminum metal, okay? So first we 
do the purification actually this bauxite ore you take and then do certain uh, unit operations to get purified alumina ok. So, how to get that purified alumina which can be used in electrolytic cells to produce aluminum that is what we are going to start with. So, first we start with the purification of alumina then we go to the electrolytic cell reduction for the production of aluminum. If you see the chemical reactions for purification of Al2O3 or uh, bauxite ore it is nothing but whatever Al2O3 in the solid form that is present in the ore that part of uh, bauxite or you know Al2O3 part of the bauxite ore would be reacting with the sodium hydroxide to give sodium aluminates that sodium aluminate will further react with water to give sodium hydroxide and then aluminum hydroxide. This aluminum hydroxide will further dissociate into Al2O3 which is a purified Al2O3 plus water. So, this Al2O3 is the purified one whereas, this Al2O3 in the reaction A is there that is whatever the 50 to 60 percent of uh, you know Al2O3 that is present in bauxite ore is there that is represented by this one ok. There may be some other side reactions may also be there let us not worry about that one these are the primary reaction that are occurring in order to purify Al2O3 from the bauxite ore. Raw materials obviously now you understand that bauxite is raw material and then makeup caustic solution NaOH is also required. So, bauxite is major one but minor quantities of makeup NaOH is also required. Quantitative requirements if you see basis if you wanted to produce 1 ton of trihydrated alumina right that is Al2O3 3H2O then bauxite ore containing 50 to 60 percent Al2O3 you need 1.3 tons. NaOH makeup solution which is 76 percent purity 40 kg is required then water is required 24 tons, steam 6 tons required power 160 kilowatt hours required. Plant capacity usually 50 to 200 tons per day. Now, we see the flow chart of a alumina purification process ok. So, for this process what you do dry bauxite whatever you get from the mines from the natural resources whatever the natural resources you do the mining and then you get the uh, bauxite uh, ore which is in dry form. So, that you uh, do the crushing of that one by jaw crusher to 2 to 5 centimeters roughly. Then that crushed material is taken to grinders usually ball mills. In this one wet grinding is done so that to reduce the size of the material to minus 100 mesh size. Whatever uh, size reduced to minus 100 mesh size uh, ore is there that along with the makeup NaOH is taken in a uh, mixer where both of them are mixed and then this mixture is taken to a autoclave which is operating at uh, 4.5 atmosphere where proper uh, reaction takes place and then you get the sodium aluminates right. So, this mixture is further taken to a series of counter current thickness. Counter current thickness now you must be understanding what is happening in thickness by this uh, time already. Thickness here you separate the material based on the density or size right. Primarily now here we are doing based on the density. So, here you do not have one single thickener you may be having 3, 4 thickeners etcetera depending on the size of the plant and depending on the how much material are you considering for the purification. So, in a series of thickeners this mixture that is coming from the autoclave which is operated at 4.5 atmosphere that is the, uh, you know from which you are getting mostly aluminates, sodium aluminates you are getting. So, those things you take in a series of counter current thickeners to which hot water is added. So, that here whatever the red mud impurities are there they will be recovered. This red mud may also be having some kind of alumina contents as well. So, then what you do you cannot throw them as it is. So, then uh, it is better to recover them. So, how do you recover? You know you, you can react with the uh, silicates etcetera and then you can get the sodium silicates etcetera and then further processing you can do. Whereas, the overflow of this uh, series of counter current thickness are there they are nothing but the sodium aluminates those would be diluted that slurry would be diluted with uh, additional wash water 
and then that mixture is taken to a precipitator where selective crystallization of uh, trihydrated alumina will take place because of uh, you know addition of this alumina hydroxide crystals as well to this one. So, whatever the slurry that is coming out from this uh, crystallization unit that is having primarily trihydrated alumina plus NaOH solution only. So, this slurry is further uh, taken to a series of uh, counter current thickeners to which hot water is uh, supplied. The purpose of this uh, second set of thickeners is to recover NaOH from the trihydrated alumina. So, that recovered sodium hydroxide whatever is there that would be concentrated in a uh, triple effect evaporator using steam and then concentrated sodium hydroxide once its concentration reaches to the 76 percent or more that would be taken to the mixer along with the makeup NaOH. So, that you know you do not need to use too much of NaOH the same NaOH can be recycled for the entire process that is the reason in this case you know you need only 40 kg of NaOH because you are recovering and then reusing it ok. Whereas, the slurry that is coming out of this uh, you know from the bottom of this uh, counter current thickness second set of counter current thickness would be you know having only Al2O3 3H2O that is trihydrated alumina only. These crystals of Al2O3 3H2O would be passed through a rotary filter so that to recover if at all NaOH still is present. So, that NaOH would be again mixed with the you know recovered NaOH and then sent to the uh, triple effect evaporator for further purification. Whereas, the almost pure Al2O3 3H2O whatever is there that would be taken to a calciner where the temperature is maintained at 1100 degree centigrade. So, that water etcetera drives off and then you have purified alumina only. This purified alumina is of a certain high grade so that it can be directly used in electrolytic reduction plant to get aluminum metal ok. So, whatever the process uh, we have seen in this flow chart the same thing we are going to see uh, by description now. Process description bauxite ore is fed to a jaw crusher to produce 2 to 5 centimeter lump size. These are wet ground to minus 100 mesh size and mixed with concentrated recycled caustic in an autoclave digester operating at 4.5 atmosphere. Slurry is washed in a series of counter current thickness. Supernatant sodium aluminate is clarified via a rotary filter where additional wash water is added. Diluted mixture is cooled and seeded in a precipitator to induced crystallization of trihydrate or alumina trihydrate. Precipitated slurry matrix is fed to another set of counter current thickness where all of NaOH is removed. Underpass is then moved to a calciner where heating to 1100 degree centigrade drives off water of hydration plus any excess water that is present so that you get pure dry Al2O3. Alumina is then cooled and shipped. Dilute caustic solution from this second set of thickeners is concentrated in a multiple effect evaporator system and recycled. So, this is about the process. What are the possible major engineering problems in this alumina purification process? Recovery of residual alumina values from the red mud discharged at bottom of first set of thickeners is very much essential because whatever the red mud as I mentioned you cannot throw directly, you cannot discard because the thickness process are not so effective that it completely separates the red mud from the sodium aluminates right. So, that red mud may also be having some amount of alumina. So, you have to recover them. So, that recovery is one of the important problem. This red mud is nothing but iron oxide and sodium aluminum silicate mud right. So, then obviously because of their uh, contents you have to recover them. Not only recovering discharging after recovering of this uh, alumina etcetera from the red mud, discharging of uh, red mud is also an issue. One method is to calcine the mud with lime and soda ash to form sodium aluminate which can be leached and then another problem is the disposal of residual red mud. Then further is that control of particle size in crystallization process is an another issue that one should be careful. So, that is what we have seen. So, we have seen how to purify Al2O3 from the bauxite 
or we have seen and then not only purification, purification to a grade so that it can be used in electrolytic reduction cell to produce aluminum to that level we have seen. So now what we are going to see, we are taking this one as raw material alumina or purified alumina that we have seen how to produce just now that we will take as input or raw material to get aluminum metal. Okay? So aluminum chemical reactions obviously it is between alumina, purified alumina this is not the bauxite or alumina, it is a purified alumina reacts with the carbon to give aluminum and then carbon dioxide. Other reaction is that carbon reacts with carbon dioxide to give carbon monoxide. Raw materials obviously purified bauxite as discussed just now plus electrode materials are made by coke, pitch and tar. Either they are continuously uh, managed or you know periodically they are replaced. So electrode consumption is more because these reactions are taking place at the electrodes and then see carbon of those electrodes is being consumed to get the aluminum. Okay? The flux that is cryolite flux is also required which is nothing but Al, F3, 3 and AF. If you see the quantitative requirements for the production of aluminum from the purified alumina, if you wanted to produce 1 ton of aluminum then 99% pure Al2O3 you require 2.25 tons, coke you require 0 0.5 to 0.6 tons. These reactions are taking place at electrode surfaces so that electrodes are being consumed. So uh, in order to make up the electrodes continuously or you know periodically replace those uh, electrodes you need you know new electrodes. Right? So these electrodes are made up of tar and pitch for that you need 20 to 30 kgs of tar and pitch. Cryolite flux you required 40 kgs and then electricity direct current 22,000 kilowatt hours required. So any electrolytic cell reaction representation is important. So electrolytic cell representation is provided here. At the anode you have Al2O3, AlF3, 3NaF at which the reaction with the electrodes takes place where Al2O3 reacts with the electrode material to produce aluminum in the liquid form. So that aluminum passes towards the cathode. Right? The oles of this reaction is nothing but 2.8 oles. Okay? This is the representation of the electrolytic cell. Now we discuss about electrolytic aluminum smelting cell. What happened here? We have a bath which is nothing but molten cryolite bath which is maintained at 950 to 1000 degrees centigrade and then within this bath carbon electrodes are being introduced and then there is a press head. So continuously these uh, electrodes are formed from coke and pitch and continuously being supplied here and then provided here. So this electrode is inserted into this cryolite bath which is at high temperature and to this bath from the top continuously you are supplying you know alumina. Al2O3, Al2O3 you are supplying so that you always have at least 3 to 5 percent of Al2O3 present in the cell. Right? So in this bath when this Al2O3 is introduced at this electrode surface what happens the reaction takes place that Al is produced as well as CO is also produced. This CO may also react with the electrodes uh, so that to give CO2 as well. So this CO, CO2 are uh, released from the top from here like this. Whereas the liquid aluminum whatever formed at the bottom that is continuously taken from the bottom. Here we have a removable clay plug as well for the removal of the any of the waste material or for the collection of the product as well it can be utilized. Either way it can be utilized. Okay, this is uh, briefly about the uh, electrolytic aluminum smelting cell. Uh, briefly what you understand here, you have a molten bath of cryolite in which carbon electrodes are introduced continuously and then this molten cryolite is at high temperature like 950 to 1000 degree centigrade. To this hot molten bath continuously Al2O3 is being supplied. So when this Al2O3 is coming and interacting with this uh, bath, at the electrode surface what happens? The reduction reaction takes place to get aluminum 
plus CO that CO may also react with the electrodes to produce CO2. So, the CO CO2 taken from the top whereas the aluminum liquid is collected from the bottom. Right? So, as the electrodes being consumed for this reaction they are continuously formed and then you know they are provided uh, supplied uh, continuously into the cryolite bath. Okay? So, description part of this process if you see molten cryolite bath is maintained at 950 to 1000 degrees centigrade. To this bath alumina is dumped periodically into each cell to keep 3 to 5 percent of alumina concentration within the uh, bath continuously. Okay? Reduction takes place at the uh, graphite anodes. These are either fed continuously or replaced batch wise as they erode because the reactions are taking place at the uh, graphite anodes. Okay? Aluminum drops to the bottom of the cell and is periodically tapped off. Purity of this alumina however is not greater than 99.7 percent. So, which is not uh, good enough quality if you wanted to using this aluminum for electric conductor usage. So, then it has to be purified to more than 99.9 percent. .9%. So, how it is done? It is done in a similar electrolytic cell approach in which at the anode whatever the aluminum copper alloy is there that reacts with the graphite at the anode and then it forms aluminum liquid which is pure and then that aluminum liquid passes towards the cathode. So, process is same only thing that now the material is different here. Okay? So, aluminum copper alloy on the bottom of the cell is tapped periodically and replenished with uh, low purity aluminum. High purity aluminum flows to the top and this is drained off under CO, CO2 atmosphere because in this reaction also CO, CO2 are forming. Normal operating voltage per cell is 5 to 7 volts with 40 to 100 cells in series using direct current of 8000 to 50000 amperes depending on cell size. Power supply for this system is AC converted to DC by mercury arc rectifiers or semiconductor converters such as silicon rectifiers. Major engineering problems of this process if you see scale up of cells to get more capacity per unit is one important issue. Then minimizing of voltage and then current losses to increase energy efficiency is another issue. So, because minimum energy efficiency should be 85 to 87 percent that efficiency may be improved if you reduce the loss of voltage and current. Okay. Devising more effective ways to feed and remove materials from high temperature cells is another issue and then development of better cell liners as well. Only graphite liners we have seen, so better cell liners could be more beneficial. And then minimizing loss of cell liquids by gas carrier, whatever the CO, CO2 gases are forming and then they are uh, taken out. So, when these gases are going out, so then some of the cell liquids is also going out. That is uh, cryolite, uh, molten cryolite is also going out. So, how to reduce such losses? That is another engineering issue one should think about. So, that is about the alumina purification followed by aluminum production by electrolytic reduction of uh, alumina. Right? Now, we discuss about copper. It is one of the most important non-ferrous metals with wide domestic and industrial applications as well. Major consumer is electrical industry and it is estimated that about 50 percent of total annual world production, not only Indian world production uh, of copper whatever is there, 50 percent of that is used by the electrical industry. That much copper is required for the electrical industry because of its electrical conductance. Remaining 50 percent is either alloyed with other metals for diverse uses like uh, making of fans and coolers or used in making pots, utensils and domestic wares, etc. It is also used in other industries like non-ferrous coatings, heat transfer equipment and then bearing metals, etc. for those purposes also it is used. It occurs in nature in the form of various oxide and sulphide ores. In India predominant ore of copper is chalcopyrite which is nothing but CuFeS2. Chalcopyrite is the major or predominant ore of copper in India. Steps of copper ore concentration process are shown in the flow chart here. Whatever 
charcopyrite ore is there that you take it and then crush it, crush it to few sizes like uh, 2 to 4 centimeters uh, in crushers, gyratory crushers, jaw crushers, etc. are used, but such uh, sizes are not good enough. So, but what you do then you do the vibration screen whatever the material having the bigger than the 2 to 4 uh, centimeter size they will be fed back to the crushers whereas the materials having 2 to 4 centimeters or smaller than that one they will be taken to a ball mill where wet grinding takes place using water. So, here further size reduction takes place because the purpose is to reduce material to minus 200 mesh. So, after the ball mill or the you know grinding in ball mill by wet grinding method whatever the material is there that would be passed through a classifier, classifier is nothing but the size separation equipment right. So, here the size of material which are having the size minus 200 mesh or smaller they will be taken to the froth flotation cell for the further processing whereas the material which are having size more than plus 200 mesh size they will be sent back to the ball mill for further wet grinding so that required size reduction may take place ok. So, in the froth flotation required uh, purification of this ore takes place by removing mud etc. In the froth flotation what you have you have the steps uh, like you know frothing agents are required then agitation is required to form the bubbles. So, in the uh, froth flotation whatever the bubbles formed so they will be carrying the lighter uh, minerals of uh, copper whereas the heavier uh, mud etc uh, gang etc would be at the bottom of the flotation cell they will be discarded as waste whereas the concentrate which is having 27 to 28 percent copper concentrate in H2O is taken for the further process by door thickener followed by Oliver filter and dryer to increase its dry concentrate to uh, less than 6 percent H2O. So, all these processes subsequent processes is to reduce H2O because whatever that purified ore that is coming from froth flotation is having lot of water. So, that water has to be removed by these steps and so that you can have a dry concentrate uh, ore which is having only 6 percent of water or less ok. So, this is the sequence of steps that are occurring in copper ore concentrate process, it is ore concentration process only. Now, we talk about another non-ferrous uh, metal which is lead. Lead is an important strategic metal because it has got both civil as well as the military applications. So, that is the reason strategically it is produced and then uh, utilized. In terms of tonnage used lead ranks fourth amongst the non-ferrous metals, fourth largest uh, utilized non-ferrous uh, metal is nothing but the lead. Largest use of lead is in batteries and it is main use in automobile industries. We see that you know most of the lead batteries or lead acid batteries are used for the you know uh, for different purposes. Consumer preference, environmental regulation and energy conservation innovations have brought about a lot of number of changes in the process. Increasing use of electric trucks at airports, hospitals, warehouses and for delivery purposes will certainly increase demand for lead batteries. So, lead production is going to shoot up anyway because its applications are used everywhere nowadays we are talking about electric vehicles ok. Lead acid batteries in railway applications will continue to be in demand because railway utilization is continuously increasing year by year for different purposes not only for the passengers purpose, but also for the goods transport purpose as well. If you see other uses of lead it is having several applications it not only as a battery. So, what are the other applications if you see it has been used as seating material on cables to prevent increase of moisture. Lead antimony alloy bricks are used in nuclear power plants to protect human beings from uh, radiation. So, in the nuclear plants it is one of the important thing actually not only for this purpose for this lead antimony alloy bricks formation purpose, but also for the discharge of uh, you know nuclear waste 
whatever the nuclear waste discharge purpose also lead is used extensively. Okay. Lead is also used in disposal of nuclear waste as well. So, it is a very important application that it is having in nuclear plants. Then another kind of uh, alloy that is lead tin alloy, it is uh, used for joining purposes in electronics, computers, etc. Soldering purpose it is used in these equipments. Architects have been using lead in construction. Why using lead in construction? Because it provides sound insulation for that purpose it is used. Then lead compounds have been used in ceramic industries also we have seen. They impart low surface tension and low viscosity over wide temperature range which results in smoothness and adds luster and brilliance to the object. Lead is used as a lining on steel tanks, vessels that store acids because it is chemically corrosion resistant. Finally, lead based paints are used extensively in structural, marine and industrial applications. We have already seen some of them in uh, paints and varnishes industries when we are talking about, right. Finally, we talk about the another uh, non-ferrous metal that is zinc. Zinc is the third most extensively used non-ferrous metal next to aluminum and copper. Aluminum and copper are the top uh, utilized based on the tonnage utilization viewpoint. After that zinc and then lead are the ones you know mostly used. Since it tends to lose its identity in the end product, it fails to attract the public awareness. That is a major problem with this one. It has several applications, but what happens? It loses its identity when it is used for certain kind of end products. Some of them we will see now. It is mainly used in coatings and castings. While doing the coatings and castings, we do not realize that zinc has been utilized. We realize about the other major coating materials. Future of zinc coating depends on the steel industry. Electro galvanizing, which is nothing but zinc plating. This when you apply it continuously to steel has been in use for many years. Automobile manufacturers have been using zinc coated steel more extensively on their newer uh, models as well. It has been estimated that amount of zinc coated materials in cars will increase by 70 percent mainly because of using electro galvanizing. Further construction industry requests zinc coatings to be much thicker than in automobile applications. So then obviously when there is a boom in construction industry then obviously there would be uh, demand for the zinc. So zinc production is also going to be uh, having a good market. Thus construction boom is bound to give an impetus to total zinc consumption. It is also used in casting, thus zinc die casting industry depends a lot on automotive industries. Finally, computers and other electronic items provide a splendid opportunity for zinc. So, we are uh, listing the sources of market for zinc which may be already there or may be chances of increased market for zinc that is what we listed now here. Now we see zinc production by Hindustan Zinc Limited what happens in that particular plant you know we take by flow chart. Here whatever the zinc concentrates like uh, zinc sulphate ore etc that is coming from the mine that would be undergoing a kind of roasting right. So that this uh, flow solids would be taken to the boiler, right. So, here gases would be evolved, those gases should be cleaned and then once the cleaning these gases, what you will be having? You may be having primarily SO2 or SO3. So, this SO3 may be utilized to get the sulfuric acid. This sulfuric acid, if it reacts with the phosphate rock, then you get superphosphate fertilizer manufacturing, right. Then whatever the calcium zinc oxide that is coming out of the roasting uh, section or unit operation that would be undergoing a leaching where the cake in the wastage in the form of cake is taken out and then purification of zinc oxide would be further done in the subsequent step. So that you get a zinc sulphate and then cake slurry. So this zinc sulphate you further do the electrolysis smelting so that to get 99.9% .9 pure zinc whereas this cake further you process 
um, by leaching, purification, electrolysis, smelting, etc., to get the cadmium. What is the point here to see is that whatever ZNS is there, that smelting or purification process is done. So that from here you are getting many. What are the ones? You know, H2SO4 you are getting, then you are getting uh, ZN, and then you are getting cadmium also, right? So this H2SO4, if you uh, react with the phosphate rock, then you get the fertilizers also. So any plant, if you have, so you try to get as many products as possible, then only any plant can be economically growing faster compared to the other plants. If you depend only on one product and then discard the other ones or other byproducts, the product or the plant is not going to be economically well established. Okay? So this is all about metallurgical industries. This much information is sufficient from uh, UG Chemical Engineering graduate point of view. The references for today's lecture are provided here. Outlines of Chemical Technology by Dryden, edited and revised by Gopal Rao and Marshall. Then Chemical Process Industries by Austin and Shreve, 5th edition. And Encyclopedia of Chemical Technology by Kirk and Atmar. Finally, Unit Processes in Organic Synthesis by Groggins. However, the entire lecture notes that presented in today's lecture is prepared from this reference book. Thank you.